Well, as people join um, this webinar, I would really like to, on behalf of the Asia Scotland Institute, of which I'm the chairman and founder, to welcome you all from around the world, looking at this extraordinarily important um, subject of uh, artificial intelligence, something in which at almost every breakfast or dinner table is discussed at some point or another, on which people have a number of views, but there's almost universal ignorance about what actually AI can achieve. So the idea of today's discussion is to delve into the intricate world of AI, um, which is increasingly occupying the minds of technologists, entrepreneurs, and policymakers alike. And I hope that in the next hour, we will be tackling with uh, an in-depth examination of the challenges and opportunities linked to uh, all these developments. So, it gives me terrific pleasure in introducing, first of all, uh, our panelists. Uh, Ching Mi Ling is, is with us in Singapore, and she's a founding partner of RHT Law Asia, which is a regional law firm, uh, and she heads its financial services, regulatory and fintech practice, and co-leads its ESG practice. And as she told me uh, a few minutes ago, they have recently elected their new president. Uh, and. Uh, uh, Singapore is known for its highly regulated environment and how it's used as a center and jumping off point in Asia for very many major companies. So thank you for being with us. I'd like thank to you. welcome Ian Dowson, who has very kindly joined us at fairly short notice um, since um, Jessica Brandt, who was to have spoken, is unable to join us. So she's not here. That is Ian and not Jessica, to be quite clear on that. Uh, and he is uh, an associate uh, with William Garrity Associates and a GovTech lead in Scotland on the subject of uh, artificial intelligence. And then finally, uh, is the, le the leading our discussions today is Professor Michael Ravatsos, who is Professor of in Artificial Intelligence at the School of Informatics, part of the Artificial Intelligence and its Applications Institute. And he's the academic liaison for the University of Edinburgh at the Alan Turing Institute, the UK's National Institute for Data Science and AI. And so now I would like, Michael, to hand the meeting over to you to take it forward and involve the panelists and participants. The idea will be that after the three people on the panel have spoken and talked, we will hope to open this up to uh, the other participants and people who signed up to listen to this uh, webinar, who should use the Q&A or chat functions, please, when asking or posing questions. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Roddy, and uh, really delighted um, to be hosting this uh, webinar today in uh, collaboration with the Asia Scotland Institute. Um, what I would like to start with is to just set the scene uh, and say a little bit more about AI, how it's been evolving and what the current big questions are. And hopefully that's gonna be then um, helpful in, in framing uh, the presentations we're going to have from Li Ling and Ian. Um, and I'd like to start just by saying that AI is first and foremost a scientific discipline and technology that aims to replicate faculties we normally associate with human intelligence in machines. So these are things like reasoning, learning, planning, making decisions, and communicating. And over its 70, 80 year long history, uh, this area has gone through many hype cycles. Uh, moments of disillusionment, moments of excitement. Um, and it's fair to say that in its history, um, it has rarely been as visible in uh, media, politics, and the public debate as it is today. Uh, now, this is due to an explosion in new AI-driven technologies uh, on the back of the enormous growth we've seen in data and computing power, and which has enabled us to use methods like machine learning to build systems that seem to achieve human level performance at some intelligence tasks and sometimes to even surpass it. Uh, these techniques primarily allow us to extract patterns from very large amounts of data. And using these techniques, AI has recently achieved some great successes that we couldn't have imagined uh, just a few years ago. Uh, for example, human champions at the game of Go were defeated by an AI system a few years ago. And this is a game that is so complex and so hard to grasp for algorithms that the AI community thought we would never even come close 
to achieving human perfor level performance uh, at this game. More recently, AI has successfully been used to solve extremely complex protein folding problems. These involve predicting the three-dimensional structure of complex proteins, and they're very, really important for drug development and, and new diagnostic techniques. Um, and of course, we cannot fail uh, to mention ChatGPT here, the first system that seems to be able to not only answer most questions uh, a human might ask it, but also to do things such as uh, pass law exams, write poems, and solve complex equations. Um, other similar so-called generative AI systems that uh, use similar techniques can create beautiful imagery, compose music, or even create the sorts of lifelike characters we might see act in the movies of the future. Now, it's important that despite all these advances, um, and despite the fact that some of these systems might seem to appear rather human-like, we are still a long way from understanding and replicating human uh, or even animal intelligence. At their core, systems like ChatGPT aren't much more than a very big and powerful variant of the kinds of text prediction algorithms we all use on our mobile phones and which suggest the most likely words you might want to type next. Um, contemporary AI systems perform these sorts of prediction tasks on a massive scale. They've been trained on the entire data of the internet and they use billions of decision-making elements to decide what response to generate to the prompt we're giving them or the question we're asking. Uh, and yet, they have no sense of whether any of the statements they're making are correct, no understanding of what information the user is looking for, uh, what is true or what is false, or whether what they will say will lead the user to make a good decision or a bad decision. So in that sense, we have created, if we can speak of intelligence at all here, uh, a very different type of intelligence, an intelligence that is based on uh, completing sequences of, of information with the most likely uh, continuation. Um, and this is an interpretation of intelligence that is based on reproducing the patterns of what people have said, written, uh, drawn before, uh, throughout the part of human history that we have captured in data in, in human society. Um, in my view, Nonetheless, AI has enormous potential to help us solve some of the world's most urgent global challenges, to increase productivity, prosperity, and well being, and accelerate scientific discovery. Um, we can use its abilities to process vast amounts of information, uh, to make predictions, and to create useful insights to help manage resources and people better, solve intractable scientific problems and create technologies that assist humans and augment our capabilities to allow us to flourish as individuals and societies. Uh, we're already seeing examples of systems that diagnose certain types of cancers on medical scans in collaboration with human doctors with a higher accuracy than uh, what clinicians could do without them. We're seeing examples where AI is used to improve processes in manufacturing, farming, energy production, uh, but there are, also, there are also much more mundane sounding uses that can have enormous benefits uh, to society. Just think of how systems like ChatGPT can help everyone write a better job application, how AI can help uh, scientists do systematic research on a topic on the internet, digest uh, all types of relevant reports, um, which is what uh, many people in academia and industry spend their time doing and in government. Uh, or how it might, for example, help people with disabilities process information that is not provided to them in a form they can easily uh, consume. Now, on a more global scale, then, of course, the race for exploiting the potential benefits of AI has only just begun, uh, and it resembles developments we have seen throughout human history whenever new revolutionary techniques emerged. Uh, so science, businesses, governments are busy exploring, testing, and assessing opportunities to use AI for their benefit. Um, and I'm certain that many of these attempts will fail, others will succeed. Uh, but I'm also certain that if we fast forward five years, 
uh, we I wouldn't be surprised if the ways in which we teach, study, work, interact with each other might be uh, quite fundamentally transformed by some of these technologies. Where there is change, there is, of course, risk. And uh, people are rightfully worried about the risks of AI. Uh, major advances in AI are currently controlled by a handful of billionaires in the tech industry. Um, new AI systems use vast amounts of data and energy and, and natural resources. Many of these systems are prone to inheriting historical biases from the data they are trained on. They might make decisions that discriminate against vulnerable groups. And more generally, also, of course, we are concerned because we feel that citizens and governments are constantly playing catch up with these new innovations that uh, are still, many of which are still poorly understood and, and sometimes hard to control. Uh, moreover, this is happening while uh, one might argue trust towards politicians and institutions and industry is not uh, uh, where it used to be in some uh, at some other points in our history. And we are facing enormous uh, climate migration, health and economic uh, crises. Um, now, looking at the geopolitical picture, we are looking at we are we are seeing different attitudes to how AI can be used and how it needs to be controlled. Um, people are asking questions such as whether market forces are sufficient to manage these risks or whether we need more regulation. Um, should state nation states and international organizations intervene more strongly and, and take the management of AI into their own hands? Um, in North America, for example, there's a reluctance to uh, impose too much regulation to avoid stifling innovation. Um, but there is also a strong interest in making sure that the development of AI for civilian and military uses uh, doesn't fall behind that of the potential enemies um, of, of some of our geopolitical uh, blocks. In Europe, there's a strong focus on regulation and on the protection of citizens and their human rights. Uh, but some argue that the slow and careful approach will lead to missing out on major opportunities for the economy. Um, the UK, where, where I'm based, is trying to position itself somewhere in the middle uh, in the hope that this will give us a unique uh, position in terms of innovation and international trade. Um, and I believe I'm getting a sense that it's similar in some Asian countries uh, where which are trying to uh, foster innovation while also being careful and, and cautious. Um, while, of course, we also have big players like China and Russia taking an approach that is much more strictly regimented and where the state uh, plays a very big role in controlling what happens in AI. So we certainly don't have a, a crystal ball to look into the future, uh, but we know that AI is now a global phenomenon. Its impacts are global and competition around it is global and it will have uh, geopolitical implications. Um, we are not necessarily set up as a global community to deal with these challenges in uh, a coordinated way. And maybe this is something that we want to discuss also today and think about. Um, and we don't know whether this will become an arms race and whether we will uh, see adversarial behaviors rather than more cooperation. Um, and we need to navigate these questions uh, honestly and 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 uh, with the right kind of open frame of mind and, and the right level of responsibility. But I'm hopeful that we will be able to collective, to develop the collective wisdom that is needed to navigate these questions. And I hope that today's discussion will um, play a part in, in doing that and, and air, uh, articulating some of the big questions and exchanging different views on them. So um, I hope that gives you a, uh, 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 an overview of the kinds of issues um, that we may want to look at. Uh, and I would now like to invite Li Ling um, to give us her statement and her view on the um, state of AI and on uh, on what you have seen happen in, in, in your area and in your region. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Michael. And um, thank you, Roddy, for this uh, opportunity to collaborate with um, Asia Scotland Institute. And I'm really, really thrilled to be on this panel with Michael and Ian and Roddy. Um, I take this as a very good opportunity where we can all um, learn and share. 
because I think AI is a multifaceted, very complex um, um, subject and no one can really profess to be an expert in, in any way. Um, for tonight's purposes, I'm going to share about the opportunities of AI um, in my area of expertise. Um, so I'm a lawyer, so I'll, I'll be talking about professional services. Um, I focus on financial services regulations and fintech. So AI has benefited the professional services industry um, in, in, very, in various ways. It has increased efficiencies for routine types of work and documentation and for compliances um, monitoring obligations. In the legal profession, AI has automated functions such as the drafting of standard contracts and court documents. Um, AI aids in knowledge management, data analytics to predict um, litigation and sentencing outcomes. In financial services, AI is widely deployed, um, impacting both the front, the middle and the back office functions from bots, chatbots interfacing with, with customers 24-7 um, to providing robo-advisory services to harnessing data to predict the probability of credit defaults and to determine the credit worthiness of borrowers. Um, to real-time scanning for transaction anomalies and irregularities in securities fraud. So these drives productivity in professional services firms and results in the professional being better placed to add greater value to the client by providing more strategic inputs and well-considered all-rounded advice, which machines cannot yet do. Um, tech advances in financial services have also lowered um, the cost of services to the regular man in the street, who now has access to digital or robo-advisory services, and investors get the benefits of computerized trading based on machine learning and analysis of vast amounts of real-time data. Machines are, of course, increasingly doing the work previously done by humans and doing them better and with less margin of error. Um, so these tech developments are changing the different professions and can cause each of us professional service providers to ponder on what it means really to be a lawyer, an accountant, a doctor, and what it means to be a good professional. So there are also the personal and societal impact of AI. Um, the, the harnessing of great computing power in the deployment of AI tools in every industry, in work, in business, and in life um, comes with great risk and has prompted calls gaining momentum um, recently <clears throat> for the regulation of AI. Um, I am a member, a council member and director of a nonprofit organization um, that my law firm had, had created. It's called RHT Grace Institute, G-R-A-C-E. The RHT Grace Institute operates the social media platform called FB. Um, it's a platform dedicated to the discussion and um, learning and, and development in issues relating to governance, ethics, and so on. So I thought today I'll frame the discussion on AI regulation um, using the acronym GRACE. I will, I will share a slide which contains my talking points, which perhaps would make it easier for you to um, um, catch the points that I'm making. So I hope you can see my full screen because um, I've got bars here and there, so I can't see the full screen. So grace in artificial intelligence, and I'm just going to run through it very quickly. And it's really just um, little um, pointers for us to ponder on in, in, on these various um, topics. When we talk about grace, the first letter G stands for governance. And for tonight's purposes, I framed it according to the AI feet principles. Of course, there are different ways in which you can frame the discussion of AI governance, for example, um, by way of data governance. So I'll talk a little bit about what is feet. Fairness, 
fairness in AI um, really talks about the fairness of the results that are generated by the machine. And for the machine to generate um, fair results, um, the input needs to be adequate. The input needs to be um, unbiased. So adequacy of data size, the, the size of the training data sets and the application of filters is very important in determining whether the outcome is, is, is a fair result. Um, the idea is really that the results do not produce unfair or prejudicial behavior. And I think we are all now very much aware of this risk of bias um, in the results that the AI system generates. So bias could happen in various ways. Annotation bias, when the person who inputs the data um, brings to it his, his or her own subjective um, judgment to certain data in, in the form of labeling the data. Um, inadequ inadequate or um, insufficient data sets that results in samples or, sorry, that results in, 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 in um, inaccurate general, generalizations. Um, when we talk about context of use, where the bias occurs, where have you ever experienced this? Um, you go online to buy something and maybe an airline ticket. And as the date comes closer and closer, somehow the machine can, can know it or the program knows it and is able to then tweak the, the price um, because they know you really want it. So whether this is a market force or um, a computer bias, I mean, it's something for us to, to bear in mind. Then I come to E. E could stand for ethics, which I'll come to towards the end, but it is increasingly being used to stand for explainability. How do we understand AI systems? Um, I think there was an interview, um, I can't recall with whom now, by whom, but um, it was interview of the Google uh, CEO, Sundai Pichai, um, who said that the machine has generated um, results which data was never input. So apparently the, the Google search, machine, search engine generated um, um, results in the Bengali language. And apparently um, there was the machine was never taught to never taught the Bengali language. Um, so it was a very um, uh, interesting, but also a scary moment because what we have now is a black box where what we can observe is the input and the output, but we don't know inside the black box how the machine uh, came up, how the machine determined the output. So, so the, there are risks, obviously, with, with black box systems. And increasingly, I think governments of, of, around the world um, are taking the position that um, where it comes to human safety, AI systems cannot be um, black, black box type of systems. And so we look at white box. White box um, is, is a good dichotomy, black and white, but whether it's realistic in, in, in real life, um, myself, I'm not sure. What white box is, is really um, the availability of the code for, for, for human beings to analyze and see how the machine actually came up with the output. Um, because AI systems are now so complex, is it really feasible and, and possible um, for a black box um, system to prevail um, um, in this day and age? Then there's the third kind, which I think more and more we hear um, people talking about the constructive approach, um, where the, the system is built with the end in mind. So it is responsible by design, it is ethical by design. So human beings control um, how the, the system is um, constructed, as it were, right? And to, to produce um, trustworthy and responsible products, um, results. Then I very quickly run through accountability. When automated systems and men interact, and, re and there are there results in death, injuries, loss, or damages. Who is liable? 
So the development of legal and regulatory frameworks around the world, we, we all need to look at um, traditional con legal concepts of, of, of negligence, for example, the concept of causation, foreseeability, um, duty of care. So um, the next um, item is transparency. So like what I mentioned about white box systems, the availability and the accuracy of the system code and other documentation to show um, auditors, regulators on how the machine actually uh, made its decision. So part of governance is has also to do with regulation, regulations by industry or by government. Um, in the EU, they are, they are close to passing the AI Act at the end of this year. China has already um, promulgated its suite of legislation um, governing AI. So there are pros and cons to regulation by industry or regulation by government. And perhaps we can discuss this later on. And with, the, with, with, with this um, tremendous interest in AI now, there's a whole multiplicity of ethical codes um, um, being generated by industry, by government bodies, by supranational uh, national uh, bodies. Um, how helpful is it to have multiplicity of ethical codes? And what is the enforceability of these codes? Which generally they, they, they are not legally enforceable. So what are the use of these um, ethical codes? Last but not least, um, Professor Mike mentioned this, geopolitics. Um, I think geopolitics and the centralization of power now cannot be divorced from um, the discussion of technology and AI. So we have governments involved, governments and big, big tech um, interacting, um, governments relying on big tech to explain to them um, how AI is, 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 is developing. So the OpenAI uh, CEO um, was invited to Washington DC I, and, and, and had a closed door session um, um, with the Senate, if I recall, together with Google, Meta, X, and, and, and others. So the influence of big tech is quite troubling because, um, and the reliance of governments on big tech is, 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 is quite troubling. Um, the, 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 the overwhelming and um, overproportionate influence of tech moguls and social media platforms um, on, on, on the lives of you know, common folks like you and me um, is also cause for concern. So that's governance. I will quickly run through the others. Our I'm, step feeling, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that we give Ian enough time to chat. I'm just watching my clock. Do you, can you just round this up, if that's all right with you, Michael, and we then get Ian's contribution? Is that all right? Rather than go through all of the things that are there, they will come sure. up. In sure. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll very quickly round up then. Risk, um, you could see the points, points there. Um, automation, complacency, copyright and consent, disinformation and misinformation, economic inequality that's driven by technology changes, and the all-important discussion of privacy and personal identity. Your machi machine profiling and cognitive um, autonomy, these are things that are um, 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 very important for regulators to address. Um, when, we come to, when we talk about uh, AML, anti-money laundering and compliance, for sure machine learning and increased compliance efficiency in KYC, transaction monitoring and fraud detection, um, makes AI a very valuable tool for, for in financial services, for example. Um, but in, increasingly, there is regulatory scrutiny on the data that is um, used and the analysis that is done by the human being. Is that over-reliance and lack of human oversight? Um, accountability and transparency. Um, as I've mentioned, whether the systems are explainable and how filters are used, how AI models are trained. Um, at the end of which, regulators would not take kindly to a uh, response to a breach that's, that, that, that says um, the machine was, was, was not correct or the machine did it. 
because human um, judgment and responsibility is still um, important. When we move on to ethics, we are concerned with um, issues relating to privacy and surveillance, um, bias and discrimination in algorithmic decision-making, um, professional responsibility, the use of AI tools by lawyers, um, and we've read news about how chat GPT is used by lawyers and generate results that are purely inaccurate and fictional, case law that don't exist. And when we talk about a ethics, we, we also want to talk about the other E, which is on the environment. The unheard voices where a lot of natural resources and labor resources are needed for this um, the development of tech. Um, the use of natural resources to manufacture supercomputing chips, um, resulting in the degradation of um, natural resources, exploitative um, labor practices. So these are the things that we, we need to um, be mindful of, and I've considered them under the framework of grace. Thank you very much. Thank you, Li Ling. I think, I think just the, the range of topics uh, we see just on that one slide uh, is indicative of the complexity of the sorts of things we have to deal uh, as societies with when we're looking at uh, at AI and um, uh, and the things we have to ponder. So um, I'd like to uh, now give Ian an opportunity to give us his views um, and uh, and really 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 uh, to see uh, what maybe it might be a completely different perspective. Okay, so where do I start on uh, uh, machine learning and AI? The year is 1992. I was sent up the motorway from London to Heathrow and given this instruction. Sell this company within six weeks or close it down. This was a machine tool company that had developed a control system to measure the length of the core blades in a jet engine to the nearest micron. They were using machine learning or fuzzy logic to do this, to predict how long the blade was. What did this give you? An extra one and a half percent fuel efficiency in a uh, high bypass uh, uh, jet engine. Um, great technolo technological development. However, they'd sold two machines for four million to uh, a large UK um, uh, uh, jet engine manufacturer. However, they'd spent 10 million developing them. Right? Um, uh, so the company was uh, uh, effectively bust. And um, so I had to move the company's research away from the modern technology to use old technology and then find the buyer. So I didn't find a buyer in six weeks, I found the buyer in eight weeks. Uh, at that time in 92, the winter, uh, the first AI winter, uh, based upon the benefits of fuzzy logic, uh, was just appearing and I was in the center of it. More recently, I've looked at two domains and the potential impacts of AI machine learning and what's called generative um, uh, AI. They are media and academia. And uh, 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 I've produced research reports on both. And in media, you have AI to text, text to image, text to video movie, text to metaverse. All of these things are emerging. And what it's going to do, it has the potential to invert the pyramid of um, a control over generation of media and its distribution. At the moment, about 80 companies control broadly 80% of the world's media industries. Uh, the majority of people in media and films and TV are unemployed at any one time. It's a very gig-based 
uh, uh, economy, very, very shortly, somebody is going to produce a, meet, uh, a movie produce using um, uh, uh, the text imagery of uh, uh, stability AI or open AI or one of the large language models. Uh, that will return $100 million. That they will get a compelling story using um, uh, the imagery. And that will turn the economics of certainly the movie business upside down, as well as the economics of the image um, uh, uh, generation business uh, uh, turns photography, uh, the economics of existing photography and images upside down. And uh, so media, I believe, is on the point of being disintermediated. The risks I see of stunt when I looked at media is that you're now getting a confluence of four main things. And in media, I include advertising. You're getting a confluence of uh, uh, computational neuroscience, computational game theory, computational behavioralism that sits on top of hyper data produced for advertising. When you combine those four domains, what do you get? You get a brainwashing machine, which is compatible um, uh, 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 in the 1960s when I grew up, right? There were many uh, uh, movies and novels. Um, the Manchurian Candidate is probably the largest one about how first stage neuroscience techniques could implant behavioral patterns in humans. Now it's even worse. Uh, 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 Musk has got approval um, um, uh, to use his Neuralink system with humans from the FDA. And one can imagine um, uh, 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 the destructive impact of that. So that's my fear about media. And I believe it should be strongly controlled. And it has been strongly controlled that uh, you have in the UK, the Television Act of 1954 that controlled commercial television. And in 1956-57, um, uh, subliminal advertising was banned. You know? So we can control new media uh, 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 technologies. In academia, um, uh, I did a long paper uh, uh, on academia, on computational academia, and I think, and it's illustrative of the changes of any domain that the teaching methods will change phenomenally. Um, uh, I don't like personalized the, the word personalized education. I think it's probably going to become precision education, where the sludge and drudge within educational systems that the whole process at the moment puts it under incredible strain will be able to be taken away but to a large extent by machine learning uh, uh, and, and going beyond robotic process automation. Yeah. And in terms of research, there's this massive open source research community, which I found is unbelievable. At uh, the uh, beginning of last year, um, uh, I found one paper on large language models. I thought that's very interesting. And I half, I understand probability theory very well, but I, I got about half the mathematics. Next day, I found two papers. The third day, I found three papers. And the explosion of open, of high quality, predominantly from PhD students and postdocs and big tech uh, uh, on the uh, uh, ARXIV um, uh, depository uh, in Cornell is phenomenal. Oh, I'm now up to about six or seven hundred papers, which I diligently try and read. 
But I'm just amazed at the voracious, the intellectual voracious community that's out there. Google comes up with something on Monday. Uh, 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 Meta will come up with a response by Friday. And then the community will take whatever they've come up with, fine tune it, and say, look here, I can do this 10 times faster or 50 times faster. So I think the genie is out of the bottle. This community is not going to go away. It's a phenomenal intellectual achievement. And what that does, I think it changes the whole basis of scientific research. And Michael alluded to Google and the folding of protein. And I think that's a tremendous intellectual achievement. But then I looked at the audit process and the, the way that Google interacted with the European uh, 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 EMBL, which is uh, the European Bioinformatics Institute. Proper scientific advanced research. They validated the Google results and they worked with them to do it. That billion dollars worth of research is now open source with the software. If that isn't a clarion, clarion call to academia to take this to another place, right? It's just phenomenal. The barrier for entry has, to come, has come down. However, the other barrier to entry is you need an exascale computer um, 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 uh, to do this, which costs a billion dollars. Uh, and I think Edinburgh's got one, if not one and a half. So you might be in a good, Edinburgh University might be in a good place, right? Elon Musk's got one, right? And uh, La Cheng Yu uh, 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 alluded to the fact that the chips in these computers are specifically designed for the computers. So Musk has designed his own proprietary chip um, uh, for his dojo um, computing rig based upon uh, NVIDIA and uh, Hewlett Packard. Uh, and Michael, do you, uh, Michael, do you agree with what Ian is, is saying about the benefits to academe? Oh, absolutely. I mean, in, in fact, I'm, I'm really uh, pleased that you use this example, uh, Ian, uh, because I do think that the way in which we do research and education, uh, I think we, w there is a real opportunity to transform those. Um, but I also think Ian's comments, I think, highlight, because if, if, if we look at the, um, the, the more uh, kind of the, the, the negative example of the brainwashing, uh, and if I combine that with what Li Ling was saying, it's kind of we, we are faced with a bit of a with a bit of a, a conundrum, which is you know how do we harness these opportunities um, while managing the risks? Well, I see also that that, that Martin Allen um, has asked this question. Um, of Ian, was academia not once independent? Uh, an independent steer. Now, interest is funded literally by the crowd. So is the is this broken people out of their silos, do you think? Well, I mean, I think I think there's a this is a broader discussion of, you know, what what the what the mechanisms are by which kind of academia is supported. But I uh, I I do think that the fact that the um, there is more public and industry interest and collaboration is fundamentally a good thing. So, of course, we can look at independence, but then the question is, what is, what is the commitment of academia to society, right? What, what do we need to do for, um, for people? Um, and now, now, whether there are illegitimate kind of industry or business interests that are getting too much influence there, I think this is, a, this is an issue we have to be very careful about. This is a technical question here from Elizabeth Marshall. He says, what is the estimated demand for additional water and electricity needed for AI use? Do you have a, an answer on that, any of you? 
unless others want to chip in i mean i it, it's really hard to estimate but uh there is there are people who have reported that the, the training of gpt3 alone required three and a half million liters of water for the cooling of the machines and uh 550 and and produced 550 million tons of carbon dioxide so i do think this is a really really um problematic dimension of what we're doing some argue we'll get better at this some argue we won't need these very big systems in the future and people are working on on bringing that down um but i do think and li ling also hinted at the at the use of resources and the and the, the use of human labor uh much of which goes into the annotation and the training in the global south while the money is made in the global north Lee do you have a view on that? Would you like to comment? Uh, yes, yeah, so rare earth minerals, um, they are so rare that um, they constitute point slightly under 1% um, of the minerals. So what that it means is that the excavator can be excavating tons and tons, but the, but the usability of, of, of the soil, only 1%, um, can be used. So it's very, very extractive. Um, and there are reports about um, folks in the Congo who use their bare hands to um, extract and to deal with the cobalt. And it's, it's highly toxic, um, both to human beings as, as well as to the environment. Um, so very much cause for concern. So the electric car that we drive is not, not that terribly clean um, because at source, it's actually very, very extractive. There's a debate about this going on at the moment in the United Kingdom about how the advantages of electric vehicles been oversold given the issues to do with their batteries. Ian, do you have a view on, on this? Well, I look at it from a different point of view. I think the power of... AI systems and generative AI systems to optimize complex systems in real time will free up so many resources in excess of the energy and water arguments that when uh, 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 the systems start to scale, the operators uh, of exascale um, uh, computing and computing rigs will use um, uh, uh, energy generated by wind uh, or solar to do that in order to counteract the argument that the burning the world up, which is basically the argument about Bitcoin and energy. Um, uh, so, but in terms of material extraction, right, you'll be able to precisely define to 99% word to date. Instead of taking the whole mountain down, you will, uh, 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 the geophysics analysis will tell you um, uh, bigger, um, uh, you know, 100 feet by 200 feet, and therefore you will find the mineral reserve. Mm. So I'm more optimistic uh, the adaptive nature of AI, which is fundamental to its productivity gains, will be applied globally to um, uh, mitigate the energy it uses. Here's another question. Um, is there a risk or is there not a risk of a gated AI community uh, becoming increasingly detached and isolationist? Michael, do you have a view on that? So, I, I mean, I'm I'm not sure whether this refers to the um to the to the AI community or whether it refers to people spending all their time using AI rather than talking to each other and becoming isolated. Uh, I think the latter we've already seen plenty of, even without AI. I would say the 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 um uh, rise of social media. Has has demonstrated these um, some of these effects, 
uh, I think in terms of the of the of the kind of a gated AI community, I do think there is an issue that at the moment we are not, you know, the, the globally speaking, the vast majority of people don't have the skills to benefit from most of the AI innovations. Um, I'm seeing comments, for example, from Pam in the chat around, you know, what, what people, how will people people might be replaced in, in what they do creatively, let's say in, in poetry or writing or other or the arts, which is a which is a big concern. Um, but what I think we can do, and, and humanity has shown that we we can adapt in those ways, is that um actually we can we can use the technology to enhance what we do as humans. I, I would really encourage people to just um uh, you know, go on the OpenAI website and play around with ChatGPT and see what the opportunities are to actually get benefit out of it for one's own work and think of it as like augmentation. So, so I think yes, isolation and exclusion might happen, um, but there are there are great opportunities to actually use the technology in um, in uh, in order to to support human flourishing. I have one instance from the creative sector, um, digital fashion design. Uh, that's predominantly done by ladies who have just come out of college uh, uh, and are designers. They've mastered the advanced AI tools. And they first, first of all started to come up with individual fashion pieces. Right? Now they come up with virtually metaverse 3D movies. And that's an illustration of they've self-taught themselves the skills that when you have, okay, you've got to be trained to a certain extent, but this is an illustration of self-taught skills, which is producing fantastic work. Michael, would you like to start sort of drawing together the conversations that we've had today? We're getting into our last five or six minutes of time available. Uh, yes, of course. Um, so I think I think uh, I, I was really um, I, I really found the the presentations we saw um, quite enlightening um, because I think they they really represent both the challenges and the opportunities. To me, I think in in a lot of what Li Ling was talking about, it became clear that. The, there isn't a there are we have not yet established and embedded the mechanisms to deal with all the risks in a mature way as we can do in other areas of technology so you know critical technologies like nuclear or, or, or biotech or, or aviation and and so on come to mind medical devices uh, where we've had enough time to create the governance structures to create the professional frameworks, the ethical frameworks. And a, a lot of the comments we're seeing in the chat also um, uh, highlight, in some sense, you know, what could go wrong. So for example, uh, how, how could we distinguish good actors from bad actors? I think the honest answer is that that is still very hard, especially at the pace that the technology is, is progressing. Um, Ian's presentation, on the other hand, I think, highlighted really the opportunities and the and the uh, and I, I think that we have to be optimistic if we want to harness the opportunities for society we have to mobilize people's creativity um we can see that we are already seeing that in many many areas uh, in many walks of life uh, i think ian gave some really uh, great examples of that and and also reminded us of how opportunities were missed in the past and that that can be very detrimental to um, human flourishing and, and economic development and, and business and education. Um, I do think there is now, we are seeing, I think that today's discussion also has shown that people across industry, academia, uh, the public sector are aware of the opportunities and challenges I think what a lot more work needs to go in is to work through the difficult questions 
and take action. So, for example, one thing that I think now always comes up in these conversations is the concentration of power. And that is a, a political issue and a societal issue. And it is not to do with technology. You know, we, we, we have demonstrated in other areas how societies can deal with those problems, but that requires some political will and it requires leadership. Um, and yes, if only the representatives of big tech are speaking to government leaders behind closed doors, then that is not likely, that's not very likely to happen. Um, so I think it's going to be an exciting area to watch. And I think we can expect a lot of future developments. Um, and I think it's important to to keep talking about it and keep raising awareness to make sure that people can make their own choices in their uh, respective walks of life. And the UK uh, seeming wishing to take the lead by having a conference later this year, I know in London, um, is an indication, I suppose, of, of the country and the government wishing to show responsibility. But as we have seen, as we've been talking today, I mean, the, the interesting issue is to what extent um, the, the application of AI in different parts of the world um, is, is emerging, whether Asia, as for example, from Singapore, has a different approach than we do in, in Scotland and in the UK. Um, and I wonder if Eileen would want to just talk about that briefly, because then we will have to need to wrap up. Yes, so Singapore, like uh, many other countries in Asia, including Thailand um, and the Philippines, um, presently we adopt a soft approach. Um, we, we do not have an AI Act as the EU, nor the legislation like, like, like China. Um, our Personal Data Protection um, Commission has issued a model um, AI framework, which is kind of a framework to guide um, businesses and companies as they develop their own um, AI systems. Um, the idea is to um, build an accountability-based kind of a framework um, that that AI developers can use to engender trust um, for, for users of the AI systems. Um, not to say that laws and regulations are good, soft laws, no regulations, not good. Um, because I think laws are very hard, very cast in stone, whereas technology is changing very fast. So I think Singapore has taken that approach to, to, to um, take a soft, soft touch and not to have regulations for unrun innovation. Thank you, that's very interesting. Well, I think we need to start, Michael, now to wrap things up. Ian, did you have anything else you'd like to, to add? Having heard no. what you No, only the optimistic. Yes, This exactly. is a phenomenal opportunity for humans to tackle problems in a different way. I can't remember Winston Churchill's definition of, of being optimistic, but he would certainly would have something to say about this. And, and Michael, we have a visit next week from the, um, the High Commissioner of India to the, to the UK, and he will be in Scotland. And um, there will be an opportunity for people to meet him, I think, in the afternoon at five o'clock, somewhere on the, uh, the Edinburgh University campus, um, because Professor Pankar is involved with that. So... If you look at our website, you'll see an opportunity to to sign up for that if you want to go. And it'll be interesting to hear what what the Indian position is on uh, handling AI uh, going forward. But to all of you, I'd like to extend my very great thanks to all of you, to our audience for asking questions. You'll see what they are on the uh, in the Q and A in the chat. We haven't been able to answer them all, but we have been dealing with uh, a very important topic. And I would like to think, certainly as far as I'm concerned, that we emerge from this hour uh, better enlightened than when we started. So to Liling, to Ian and Michael particularly, thank you, all of you, for helping us at the Asia Scotland Institute with this discussion. And please stay in touch with us and help us and support us continue to put on programmes that we do. So thank you all very much indeed.